Good evening, everyone. I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute and a very warm welcome to this evening's event on performance poetries. This is the latest in our series of monthly in conversation events, which are part of our research season on sculpture and poetry. The research season lasts until February next year and features four of these pairings in which we set up a renowned sculptor and a renowned poet on a kind of artistic blind date. Although each pair of sculptors and poets haven't met before, in each case there are clear points of intersection between their practices, and it's those relationships and overlaps that we will be investigating this evening. We have been working in collaboration with Nick Thurston, who is Associate Professor of Fine Art at the University of Leeds and Research Fellow at the Leeds Poetry Centre. Nick is a writer and artist who has published numerous books and is a regular contributor to journals, including Freeze, After All and Bob. Nick's books, prints and sculptures are held in a number of collections, including the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, Leeds City Gallery, the V&A, Tate and MoMA. And Nick is chairing all four of the In Conversation events in this series, so I'll be handing over to him in a moment to introduce tonight's special guests. Our other partner in the research season is Corridor 8, the non-profit platform for contemporary visual arts and writing in the northwest of England. And Corridor 8 have developed the new Sculpture and Poetry website, which will act as a repository and an archive for all of the events in the research season, as well as a whole wealth of resources, interviews, further reading material and commentary. Corridor 8 have also commissioned four new pieces of writing in response to these In Conversation events. And the first of those, written by Callan Waldron Hall, is now available to read online on the Sculpture and Poetry website. So a link to the website will be coming up in the chat, where you can also find links to the introductory pieces of work by both of tonight's contributors, Vani Capildeo and Simone Forti. Please do explore the Sculpture and Poetry site. It's beautifully designed and it is full of brilliant stuff. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Nick Thurston to introduce tonight's speakers. Thanks, Claire. Um, I'd encourage all of you in the audience to submit your questions for tonight's speakers anytime via the chat function. The sooner they arrive, the more likely it is that I can ask them on your behalf. So I'm just here to ventriloquize. I'm here to do that and just to prompt the discussion. Um, much more importantly, we're joined tonight by two incredible guests. You can find fuller, illustrious biographies for both of them on the Sculpture Poetry website. But just to say, from her home in Los Angeles, we've got the Italian-American multimedia artist and poet Simone Forti, best known for her lifelong explorations of movement. And from a college in Cambridge, where she's currently a visiting scholar, we're also joined by the Trinidadian British writer Vani Capildeo, best known for their relentless innovations as a poet. So we're going to jump straight into the conversation. And I wondered if we could start with one of our anchoring terms, sculpture. I wonder if we could start by talking a little bit about your respective relationships to sculpture or the sculptural, those things that we associate with, with uh, weight, three and four dimensional space, persistence, form, display, architecture, et cetera. Um, so Simone, could I ask you to start there? Yes, <clears throat> sculpture. Well, speaking generally, I, I see something in space and in placement in relation to other solid things in the environment. So space between objects, for me, sculpture, a lot of the meaning, a lot of the enjoyment has to do with placement. When, when I was, um, in my early 20s, I made a series of pieces that I called dance constructions. I thought of them as sculptures and also as dances. And just quickly to describe what I mean, um, Huddle is a piece that 
is made up of maybe seven people or maybe up to 10 people. And they make a, a strong little mountain, I sometimes use that term, and take turns climbing over the top and down. And then someone else, you don't know who's going to go. There's a lot of improvisation in, within that very strict um, range of movements that, that comes naturally in climbing. Uh, and so there's this, this solid little mountain. And uh, I saw it. Um, I forget what city it was and what museum, but there was a performance of Huddle uh, at some distance from where, where the public could go. You mainly would see it from the cafe and you'd look across a, a small lake and their Huddle would be up in the, on the lawn. Thanks, Simone. And, 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 and could I also ask about your experiences of collaborating with sculptors over the years? Because as I understand it, there have been many. Yes, well, the main collaboration, which maybe was more a collaboration from discussion and what, what we would each draw from talking together, was with Robert Morris, who I was married to for seven years. And in fact, uh, getting back to the, that concert that I did with these dance construction pieces, one, for instance, is, is a board, I call it slant board, at a 45 degree incline with ropes on it. And people were climbing around on it. And I, I felt a lot of interest in in um, Moorbridge and the photographer, Edward Moorbridge. And the beauty of simply doing something. And so that you could just watch the body in action, not trying to be beautiful, but so you could see the beauty naturally. And um, when I thought of doing the piece, I didn't know how I was going to build it because I'm I'm not good with the hammer and nails, and um, so Bob built them for me. Um, and that was very much a collaboration because conceptually, we were talking at breakfast. We we, we were. We were working, talking about things that we saw. Other, I don't know about exactly a collaboration with other sculptors, but uh, I have a beautiful photograph that Peter, Peter Moore took. And um, I've done a lot of work on my hands and knees. I, I love to be on my hands and knees. And I, I've done a lot of exploring of how to get from striding, standing posture down what the transition is to get to hands and knees. And I'm striding along on my hands and knees in front of a Henry Moore. <laughs> um, piece that looks very much like a rhinoceros. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a very vivid image in my head. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for that start. Um, Fanny, can I ask you the same question? Your relationship to sculpture or the sculptural? I grew up in Trinidad in the Caribbean and I, I was surrounded by sculpture so my family were practicing Hindus, and I remember being introduced to a sculpture of the dancing god of destruction, Shiva, in his dancing form and in a particular pose and with a drum. And it was explained to me that when he beat that drum, 
it would create the destruction of time. So the actual musical instrument which you use to keep time, you use, if you're that god, to destroy time. There's quite a huge sculpture very casually there in the back of the temple courtyard where my, mother, my grandmother grew roses. And it was this huge movement in bronze, which we just walked around as if it were perfectly normal to have the concept of the cosmic destruction of time via dance and drumming frozen in bronze. But you see, when I went to Oxford as a student at 18, I said I didn't know anything about sculpture because in my mind that wasn't a sculpture. There's a great tradition of carnival which has got elements surviving of all the different religions and spiritualities uh, which have gone to the region, including West African spiritualities. And again, I wouldn't have thought of that as sculpture before now, but possibly it was that association in my mind uh, very early on between a large still object and the extreme potential for human movement, uh, which made me, when I eventually went to Florence, uh, in my late 20s, most obsessed with Michelangelo's Prigionieri in the Academia, which are incomplete sculptures, which seem to be fledging out of stone, the way you could imagine a dinosaur sort of hatching with dinosaur feathers out of an egg. And uh, so you can see the arrested movements of the mind and the chisel still coming forth uh, so it, it it doesn't feel like something that's unfinished it feels like something's ongoing uh, the other thing i realize now is sculptural which i do put into words uh, is i get obsessed with everyday stuff this this arrived in the post uh, around a tiny flossy squeaky bear it's advertised as a tiny flossy squeaky bear <laughs> which i'm giving to someone as a christmas present but i get very obsessed by the texture, the translucency, the reflect, the refraction. I also get obsessed by things like used tea bags. And I remember when I was younger, spending hours holding them up to the light. And some of the images in my poems uh, that people have thought of as being strange or opaque or surreal are actually related uh, to what I now realize were long meditations. I, I wonder if we could take that point as a cue to to jump to to the other half, the other topic. I'm talking about um, your relationship to poetry, all of those ideas and things we gather under the idea of the poetic, um, be that the lyric, the idea of polysemic language and the like. Um, I don't know, Vani, do you want to come continue there and we, we can pull you back up out of the water? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'm doing this very weird thing now of speaking into my phone in order to make myself audible. And I had been talking about everyday objects uh, that mediate uh, our sight and our touch. It's often from meditating on objects like that so that I derive images that people used to think of as being surreal or difficult in my poetry. Because I wasn't being surreal or difficult, I was trying to be very plain, that I can't pretend uh, that I was sitting down with 20 20 vision and uh, gloves or surgical gloves on or something, uh, unwrapping the bear. I was seeing the little bear through this. And <laughs> so that was very unkind to the bubble wrap. I feel bad now. So the other thing is that because I was interested in plurilingualism and translation from early on, as I'm never thinking in only one language, and I don't believe anybody's ever thinking in only one language, uh, even if it's just that we're thinking in dialect or slang or the language of dream or whatever. I, I never really agreed, and I've said this very often, with the idea that Eluard, the French poet, puts forward of the margins of the page as being margins of silence. I always saw the margins of the page as being margins of stirring or margins of a more sort of tidalectic movement or potential noise. And eventually, I started thinking of lyric poetry as being something that you can only hear because of everything else you hear that isn't lyric. So it stands out by contrast, a bit like you can see a yellow bird in a tree because it's not green and brown. Thank you, Vani. Um, Simone, again, to just sort of lay the ground to start with, can I ask you the same question about your relationship to poetry and the poetic? 
Yes. Well, my main form, form in which I've worked with language has been improvising, moving and speaking. Uh, and in fact, um, there was just recently an exhibit of my work in Italy, outside of Florence in Prato at the Pecci Museum in Prato. And a lot of it was videos of the, some of these performances moving and speaking. And from there, the, the curator, one of the curators had the idea of making a catalog of transcriptions of these improvised speakings. And I've been calling them news animations because I uh, work with what's going on in my mind. And even, even as I say that, I'm going, stirring it with my hand. I had no intention to do that. Uh, and the, the movement is very much, um, here I go with my hands again. The movement is very much um, kinesthetic images in space. I think we all have them. Uh, if you're gonna figure your, what your day is gonna be like, you, you get these images of, of a big space or a narrow space or something that has to be very put together. Um, and I can play those images out in my body. And so for me, language and movement are very much together. I, now I've had Parkinson's going on about six years and um, my body doesn't do it for me so much anymore. I, I've gotten interested in doing more writing. I've, I've always written, I've always made poems even in high school, and, but it's never been, I've never felt like I had my thing with that. With, with, with dance over the years, there's been periods of 10 years, 20 years um, where I was exploring a certain way or, or found a vehicle. I haven't done that with my writing, but I am now wanting to do that and exploring writing this way, writing that way. Um, however it comes out of me, but it, it's very mysterious to me when you get an idea. Have, do, have, have you always read poetry as well, Simone? Has that always been a big part of your reading life? Very little, but I've, I've found that the, the poets I best relate to are, or have been, the generation right before the beats, um, William Carlos Williams, um, I'm, I'm losing the names, but you get the idea. And, and now I'm reading Kurt Schwitters and, and I'm interested in, in the Cubis. And, and I'm, I'm finding that Schwitters has, has um, um, what's the word for not poetry, for writing that just goes on, but it's not poetry. And, and so it's, you, you can't really understand it in, in the usual understanding way, but there's something about it that's, that's emotionally so 
I'm coming up with a word clear. A, a kind of stream of consciousness writing. I guess so, but not really because it, it, it depends on a decided on patterning. Of, it, it has some um, tasks that it must that it must carry out so that if the stream of consciousness it's it's channeled very rigorously and uh, i love to read things i don't understand i can just read them and read them and read them like the kabbalah writings uh, they they're just so impossible for me to understand anything about what i'm reading and i love to read it Vani, can I ask you the same question? Just, just quickly to, again, just finish setting the, the tone about your reading habits around poetry. When did they form? And if it's not too big a question, how do they keep changing with you? I think my reading habits around poetry have changed a lot over time. Uh, first of all, because when I was growing up, my father was a poet uh, and uh, I didn't realize he, in a small way, he was very much in a similar project to William Carlos Williams, uh, in that he was keen on writing the voice of the place uh, and voices that we heard around us. Uh, and uh, quite often he would uh, get rejections from publishers in England uh, because they didn't see him as doing what they wanted in terms of performing a certain kind of tropical lyric. Uh, but he was in correspondence, personal correspondence with Kamau Brathwit, uh, who called him brother. And the other thing is that my mother knew a lot of French poetry by heart. Uh, and I was used to hearing her reciting in French and also singing in Spanish and sometimes in Hindustani. So my ear was being tuned. We studied very, very little poetry at school. I think we studied almost no poetry at my convent school partly because people were trying to decolonize the curriculum, partly because we happened to have an English teacher at the time who hated teaching poetry. So we did extra theater, which I now see as a form of poetry anyway. And when I went to university, I decided I wanted to do medieval studies and uh, linguistics. Uh, and I think we could relate that to experiencing language as sculptural. So I remember being really fascinated uh, looking at how the clusters of consonants uh, remain relatively recognizable with some transformations uh, between different forms of a word, say in Old English, uh, or between Old English and Old Norse. Uh, but the vowel in the middle can is almost elastic. It can widen, it can smoosh, it can disappear. It can, it can pop up again in all sorts of ways. Uh, so thinking of that, how the word stops itself, uh, and then how uh, as being uh, the thing you look for, and then the way the word lets in air, the way breath enters or is expelled as being what changes from person to person, region to region over time. I really loved that sort of poetics, just of the breathed and spoken syllable in linguistics. Nowadays, what I find quite hard is there's a lot of guilt reading of poetry I'm expected to do. So it'll be very much like uh, there are at least 20 new collections this year, which I would really love to read. But in a way, they're not coherent with my reading project. So some of them are things I want to read alongside much earlier books or alongside work that isn't poetry at all. But there is this terrible sort of media pressure. These 20 books have come out in a form called poetry in this period of time. And they exist in this sort of tessellation and I think that's actually untrue. There's someone like Yusuf Kazmier, whose extraordinary collection from Broken Sleep, Writing the Camp, talks about love and identity growing up in a Palestinian camp in Lebanon, and very much the movement of the body, the embodiment through those areas. I want to read that against Gaston Bachelard, for example, in Poetics of Space. I don't necessarily want to read it alongside everything else everyone happens to have published who's a poet. I really want to go back to that poetics of the inhabited space. I'm, I'm so pleased that we've so quickly connected um, sort of <clears throat> life experiences and creative life, because it's one thing that I've told you both before, it's struck me about 
about both of you is that you seem really fearless about connecting your creative work to your life experiences. You both make work that explicitly responds to the world around you and your experiences of it. So I wonder, could we talk a little bit about that? Could we sort of stay with biography and talk about the connection between biography and some of the tendencies or directions that your practices have come to take? I, I wonder, Simone, could, could, could you start there? Um, I know it's a big question, but. Yes. Well, I think a very important moment for me was um, when my father died and um, also a few months before I had broken up with my husband at, at the time. And uh, with my husband, I had been Peter Van Riper, we had been touring. He was a musician, played saxophone mainly and many small instruments. And I danced and we went on tour. And when we broke up, that form of work was, wasn't working anymore. We, we weren't working together anymore. So that had kind of been pulled out from under my feet and my father died. And so I, I was in one of those moments of being at loose ends and not knowing what was going to come next. And I started a workshop for people who were at a transition in their work. And I limited it. I think there were maybe six of us or seven in the workshop. And we would meet for three hours once a week. And different ones of us would take over if someone felt they needed two hours or they needed one hour. And we would look at our notebooks and we would try out things on each other and talk about things that were on our mind in terms of what work direction we could be going in. And uh, there was one woman who had become very distanced from the news and she wanted to be more closely involved again with political things, but she wanted a more personal relationship to the news. And so she thought that taking a workshop from a dancer would bring a more physical sense of the news. And uh, my father had always read the news, two or three newspapers every day. And I felt that he knew in 19, 38 that it was time to get out of Italy, partly because he really knew what was going on. And many people thought, oh, we're going to be all right as Jews. And um, I really felt secure as long as he was alive and reading the news. And when he died, I thought I'd better start reading the news. And and um, this woman had us do certain exercises with photographs in the newspapers or the headlines. And um, it, it clicked with me. Um, I, I loved the physicality of the paper, of the newspapers. I, I started performing with big stacks of newspapers and making pathways, making maps, working in the newspapers, um, making them blow in the wind, so to speak. And um, that set me on a new direction that, that supported me and nourished me for decades. 
So that that's one example I can give. And, and can I, you'd always been drawing, right? Drawing had always been something important to you. Yes. Yeah. But not so much drawing as drawing, but more drawing as, as it related to explorations I was making in movement. Okay. But but not exactly as a kind of notational practice for that, not not a scoring, more something no. more responsive. Yeah. No. No. Uh, finally, sorry, can I can I ask you the same question? I, again, I appreciate it's a massive, massive one and slightly unfair, but this connection between biography and personal experience and the creative work and how it's changed. Is that something you'd speak to? That I, I do believe people contain multitudes, or rather that the channel are the voices. And I wasn't particularly interested in writing what people call my own voice. And uh, so the first published book I had, uh, which is called No Traveller Returns, uh, was what I called an oblique autobiography, where it went through places and experiences which I might have witnessed, uh, but I wasn't present in the scene. Uh, there weren't necessarily stories. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a suite of poems about Tobago, the small island to the northeast of Trinidad. And uh, basically, one of them is about these strange staircases uh, which are cut into the coral reefs down to the sea, or the coral reef cliffs down to the sea. And uh, at different points, the tide, which is from the Atlantic, comes in, and uh, the staircases are not safe to go down. And you can see as you go, at least I think they've made it a little safer now, but in the 1970s and 80s, as you go along the bay, you could pick your level of danger. And I remember going down one staircase too early on purpose because I told myself, look, the water's only that shallow, it'll barely cover your ankle. And I stepped into this water, which was champagne colored because the sea was churning up the sand. And I staggered and almost fell. It was like a rope had gone around my ankle. Because even though it was shallow, it was like a shallow lasso of pure Atlantic current. And so for me, writing a poem which dealt with those experiences uh, and made the effect of being lassoed by the sea was more important than saying, when I was eight years old, I was in Tobago with my parents and I did this. I didn't want the story of the person going down the staircase. I wanted the feeling of the sea encountering the walking human. So that was the kind of thing I did, but then nobody seemed to know what I was doing. And <laughs> I don't know, I mean, I don't want to get heavily post-colonial, but people kept on reading my book as if it were writing about me and that I must have experienced some sort of disturbance about going to a cold country and what was it like growing up as a girl, that, that sort of rubbish, which I'm sure is, is you know, lovely for other people to do who aren't me. And that was just not where my head was. And what was really interesting was when I started sharing poetry with other people, when I started teaching at Girton College in Cambridge, I was only 27 and my eldest student was 24. I used to try to overcome this by wearing layers and layers and layers of black, but still almost all my students were much taller than me. <laughs> so it didn't really give me any sort of dimension. But I remember sitting and doing practical criticism with them and going over small bits of poetry again and again in the course of an hour and just hearing how differently people would be struck by those poems. And I remember we were doing a bit from White Sargasso Sea, which is, of course, Jean Reese's answer to Jane Eyre. And in it, the protagonist is imagining being buried under a flamboyant tree. And one person said, oh, oh, that shows her character. She wants to be buried under a flamboyant tree, thinking it meant a showy tree. And then I said, no, a flamboyant is a particular kind of tree with silver bark and fl flame colored canopy and long seed pods like dark brown machetes. And I realized that you can't take anything for granted, that the treescape, everything being evoked in people's minds will be utterly different. 
And I, I think those seminars and practical criticism in Girton College in the 2000s uh, was where I started getting interested in creating collaborative theatre from reading poetry over and over with people and finding out what embodied experiences uh, it evoked in them and then how we can reanimate to the text. It's really interesting because you, you both, like Simone and your mention of that particular workshop experience and there, uh, Vani, as, as you start to talk about the possibility of this theatric engagements, you're both talking about process. I, I couldn't help but note that. And, <clears throat> and I, I wonder if, if that's something we could turn to now, the importance of process to your practices. Um, and, and one really obvious thing to restate about the work you've both made over the years is that they seem very process led, if that's not too crude a way to put it. Um, could we talk about that? Ideas of process, the process led, and maybe something about ideas of open form and closed form without sort of preempting everything that we'll say. Um, Simone, maybe could I turn to you with that one first? Yes, yes. Well, workshopping has been very important for me. And it's something that I learned from my teacher and um, my person who inspired me, I'd say the most, is Anna Halpern. And she, in her early 30s, uh, broke away. She was a dancer and she broke away from ideas of technique and ideas of teaching technique. And she uh, started to teach improvisation and to explore what that would mean to her, for her, how, how she would do that. What was she interested in about improvisation? And for instance, in terms of technique, we were still, you could say, working with technique, but it was more with ex, what you might call experiential anatomy. And she had worked with Margaret Dobler, her teacher, and she brought this way of studying the anatomy, like we would look at a skeleton or we would look at an anatomy book and maybe work with the area, the shoulder area of the body and understand it mechanically. And, and then she would have us work in the studio for maybe 30, 40 minutes, exploring the movement of, of that area of the body. And of course, the whole body comes in to support that, that exploration. And um, pretty soon, it, it takes you. It, how, how to express that? Um, movement starts to happen. You, you start to discover movement. You get carried away in it. You, you move slowly. You move quickly. You, you explore the momentum of a swing in the arm while you're running. And, and it's joyful. And how did I get onto this? I got into the joyfulness. <laughs> it's a lovely place to get to. But I guess, is, is this something like that kind of, I mean, you've used the phrase, the dance state before. Is, is that the kind of joyful yeah. finding of? Yes, that, that, um, that loop where, where you're very aware of sensation and that awareness gives you an impulse for, for moving within the range of what you're working on. And right away, the situation has changed because of what you've done. And now you're responding to that. So it, it's an ongoing um, listening and answering. Um, and this is the improvisational that's, dynamic, if you like, yeah? Yes. and. And you're also doing a lot of editing as you're working. 
you realize you're on to something or 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 you're not and you have different techniques for waiting and um and in the workshops we would work with different kinds of focus i've just described it and an anatomical focus but also we have the attitude that any movement could could really work mm -hmm. and and the movement in of trees um or bugs because her, her studio was outdoors at the foot of mount tamil Park in outside of san francisco mm -hmm. and um taking on certain qualities of movement that that we had observed um it could be a jacket falling to the floor um one time as i was giving a talk to some students and i tossed a, a stool a, a, and the stool went clunk 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 clear across the space and it had a very particular movement quality and so we were working with movement qualities um with movements and um that was a big influence for me that it wasn't just certain kinds of movement that were of interest it, it was movement yeah yeah and, and that responsiveness and that openness those are qualities that you try and maintain in the improvisational form of your own constructions and yeah Vani, can I ask you the same question about process and form? But 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 I also want to loop back to something you mentioned in 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 the last section about uh, trying to write feelings, uh, almost like a, using techniques of allusion and 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 the, and the and the like, and how that also kind of resists any simple opposition between intellect and emotion, because there's something both studied about it, but also kind of again, open about it. I guess this is the connection I'm trying to make. Um, so could I actually talk to both those things, the process question and then the intellect and emotion as opposed to versus emotion? What I'm finding I want to do in this conversation is not to give answers that uh, seem like explanations, uh, but rather to put forward instances uh, which are being evoked in my memory, which seem to have relevance to the questions. So to put forward a thick and anthropologically thick description of an instance containing process, rather than to say my process is X, Y, and Z. And uh, one, one thing, for example, is that I am aware of feeling haunted. I used to be very fascinated by ghost stories, even though I don't really believe in ghosts and uh, I nonetheless had the feeling of being haunted by works that wanted to be made now I have more feeling of listening into or through silence I don't mean that they pre-exist in some sort of platonic way but that there's a quality of attention I bring to something that's forming and so my process has to be reinvented for everything I can't arrive at how to do the perfect sestina and then apply that technique and write 35 sestinas, about 35 pictures in the National Gallery. I mean, I could, but I would be incredibly bored and I would find a way to, to sabotage it. That's just not interesting. And for some reason, what I was thinking about, uh, I'm not, with well, two things I'm thinking about, and I'm just going to put these here as examples of what, of what, what or maybe three things. One, one is that, uh, I'm not good at movement. I'm not a natural dancer in any sense. Uh, I recently broke one of the fastenings in my walking boots just by intertwining my ankles in the wrong way when I was sitting down. That's extremely, extremely characteristic of me. Those are walking boots designed not to be broken by mountains. I can break them by sitting down. And, uh, and uh, 
when I, I have subjected myself to a lot of movement classes because I, I like being embodied in ways I'm not good at. And I've noticed that there's a difference in that I take away a little bit of something that I learn and I run away with that and I want to do it over and over and over again. And that's enough for me to revolutionize my imagination. So for example, when I was doing a class in Cambridge on improvisation, and we were told to make one gesture as small as we possibly could, and then make one gesture as large as we possibly could. That was incredibly important to me. And I just became obsessed with that. And we had something like four hours of class, but I have no recollection of anything else. And that's something which I now take into my writing, a thing to do with imagination. Can you pan out? Can you focus back in? in all sorts of different ways. So the second thing is thinking about is the difference between feeling something in yourself and imitating it. And I was thinking about what goes into poetry and Sylvia Plath complaining that you don't get things like toothbrushes in poetry. And in early Sylvia Plath, what a lot of people don't credit her with enough is that she uses all kinds of materials like gingham and all the fabrics of her girlhood. Her early poetry is very textured. It invokes the materials she was living with and among. And uh, I was thinking of how many extraordinary experiences we have, uh, which either don't make it into poetry or they become the subject they are told about, but rarely they need to become ways of being. So whether it's something as little as having your circulation cut off because you're sitting badly and then trying to walk on that numb foot or whether like me you stupidly go on something called adventure caving without any experience and you're required to go through something called the letterbox and there's a mass of red rock above you and a mass of red rock below you you have to lie flat and inch like a snake before you get out into the next bit of the cave definitely one of the worst experiences of my life but if you panicked you would just have thrashed like a snake and knocked yourself out I should probably have given you a content warning for that as well but I remember feeling how I had to activate my sense of my ribs and then my sense of my breathing and keep my breathing calm and just inch along on my ribs and I was being told the rock was called the letterbox but really I was feeling like a snake in the bowels of the earth and then can that translate into writing and so, you know, could I not write a poem which is the story of I went adventure caving, I was really bad at it, but this was really interesting, but instead do something in poetics which gives you that feeling of suddenly becoming between two huge masses of rock, this breathing horizontal. I'm just wondering, Simone, if you, you'd you have any immediate reaction, because I was immediately resonating with your distinction between dance as some sort of grammar or specific cultural vocabulary and movement as such as a thing we innately do and, and happens all the time. And this idea of sort of artistries that sort of recognise things that don't normally sit within those formal cultural grammars. I just couldn't help but note a connection there between what Varney was saying um, about an experience of a situation that you're expected to think about in a certain way, but actually experience in a different way, and then trying to find a responsive way of dealing with that other experience. Is that, is that something that resonates with you in terms of some of the experiences you're talking about? More broadly, what you were saying about the workshop experiences of sort of trying to respond to incidental noises or gestures or movements and trying to stay with that, even if it's a stool being flung across a room or a well, one of the exercises that I work with is I ask people for a movement memory snapshot. And um, I started to fall and I'd slip and then I'd be able to just balance my weight a certain way and get myself jammed into the space a certain way and the fall would almost stop, but then it would continue. And then I'd get to another place and I'd try not to fall and I almost had my balance again. And then I didn't and it would continue. 
And that's the snapshot. And, and it's difficult for people to get the idea of leaving it as a snapshot and not saying, I had gone to my uncle's house and he was had some ladders up against the building and I tried to climb the ladder and then I started to fall. Um, why am I coming up with that? Because it's an exercise I give. And then I have people work with that dynamic of movement as they remember it feeling in their body. And then maybe working with a partner and teaching each other the movement or the, that movement quality. It makes total sense and connection to me in terms of removing some of that narrative expectation and trying to stay with a feeling as, as Vani, as, as, as I was hearing you say. And, and, and trying to do the difficult thing of, of writing that staying with the feeling. Yeah. I can't help but notice we're, we're circling back time and again to ideas of embodied experience. Um, and it's something you both wholeheartedly engage with or, or, or maybe better put, kind of both refuse to deny its obviousness. Um, I wondered if we could talk specifically about embodied experience and how in particular it connects to your relationships to language in both cases. Um, Vani, would you mind starting? Yes, what, what I was thinking of uh, was the, the beautiful first example, Simone, uh, the first video which you gave us for the website for the event tonight. Uh, and I was noticing when I was looking at that, I don't know whether you, you it doesn't matter if you intended it, but I got a feeling of joy when you reach the top bit. There's a kind of lightening and brightening, and I can see your your mouth relax. And uh, it was remain that that, and I also was very taken by the way that you were emitting sounds. And uh, it reminded me of two things. Uh, one, it reminded me of uh, Francis Ponge and his description of trees as proceeding by excroissance, a word he invented, which is a growing outwards, and also as communicating by means of gestures, par moyen de geste, but because they stay in place, they have to communicate par moyen de geste. And I was thinking how tree-like that was because of the kind of, of moment where you could imagine transpiration or the moment where you could imagine photosynthesis or that opening at the top compared to when people do something like the yoga exercise popularly known as the tree where they look like trees that have been tied at the top because they kind of get into the pose and it's like can, can i stay here can I, can, I, can I stay here and they look like those sad christmas trees which have been plastic and tied at the top so one thing that interests me with that, the other was just the kind of natural exhalations in the, in the example that you gave and what that is like, what that maps. Because in terms of my own reading and writing, there are a lot of ways I could approach the question, but something I've been trying to do this year is a workshop I sometimes call it sitting with difficulty and sometimes I call it sitting with discomfort. And, uh, this involves my reading a poem slowly several times over to people who also have the text in other media and asking them to note down their physical changes as they hear the words. Often these are poems which have uncomfortable content in terms of violence or racism or other things that people don't want to have to deal with, especially nowadays. But what I try to do is a kind of somatic map, and I don't ask them to share it. I just go over and over it, and, and I try to see where does your throat tighten? Where does your breathing change? Where do you want to say something aloud? Where are you distracted by sounds outside? Where does your posture shift? And then I try to bring that somatic map of response back to the linguistic shape of the poem as a thing made with words. And I, I try to then create a practical criticism reading, which includes the somatic response of the reader. 
And it's interesting because, for example, Shivani Ramlochan, who's a young Trinidadian poet, uh, she's got a poem which is, got, which is dealing with rape, but through the point of view refracted of carnival masqueraders and the Manitou and Macbeth. Uh, and there's one very long line in it, which goes into iambic pentameter, and then the next line comes up very short. And people always react to that in their own bodies. But whenever you ask them, can you analyze this poem formally? They, they never count the syllables, they never look at the line length, they never see it. this is iambic pentameter and it's been brought up short. The way they tend to arrive at that much better is by doing the somatic map and saying, well, we felt the journey opening out, then we felt this. And I said, okay, you felt that there, now what can we count in the language or what is the language doing? So that, that, that analytical habit or tendency to disembody the reading for the sake of analysis is, is, is something you actively resist, right? Yeah, it is something I started resisting this year. It used to be very much my thing of being entirely in my head because I believed that that was what I was doing. And then as I noticed people becoming angrier and angrier about different things over the last five years, quicker and quicker to express rage, I started wondering why these emotions are slapping up and what happens if you just slow down with the body as well as the text. I completely slow down. Two examples of slowing down, there were floods when I was living in Oxford and I was working in London. So I looked for somewhere cheap to stay. And I was given an attic room by the Anglican Franciscan community in Southwark, even though I'm not Anglican or Franciscan, they sort of kept me as a pet for a little bit. And uh, they said very nicely, you can join us at our reading in the evenings. And I didn't realize their reading was Lectio Divina, which was taking little bits of the Bible, but not to convert me. They're sitting in the living room and one person would read a bit very slowly and then there'd be an extraordinary amount of silence. And then someone else would read another bit and there'd be an extraordinary amount of silence. I, I mean, I've seen Lectio Divina done in other ways since, but this was extraordinary to me that the words would be allowed just to sit there while we return to them in memory. But for me, one of the different things between sculpture and poetry and how people put, that, put those two media forward is that people expect to be able to return to sculpture or walk around it. And of course, someone like Carla Black, who makes disintegrating sculptures, such as recently on show in Edinburgh's Fruit Market, works against that. Someone like Maya Chowdhury, who created something in moss that was growing and changed itself. But in general, the kind of stereotypical idea is uh, you hear a poem, it's one and done. You can go and revisit a gallery. And I really want to break down those stereotypes. Uh, I really want us to be much, much more aware of being embodied revisitors of language. There's lots I want to pick up on there, but Simone, could, could I start by bringing you back in, in to, to Vani's question about your performance Song of the Vowels that you shared with us um, and about that experience of kind of getting through up to the top ends of the response in the response to the sculpture and the use of breath and exhalation. Yes. Well, I, I was taken by that sculpture, especially what seems to be the backside of it because I'll, I'll use my hand here, let's say the sculptor, say this is the front and this is the back and it's concave and symmetrical. And it looking at it feels like this inside of my mouth from from my point of view, so that I get into my mouth and I I feel the teeth and, and I, I feel the bones and I feel the holes in the bones and 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 I could bring that into my body, that concave with open spaces. 
And when I had been looking at it, my eye was traveling on it, on the surfaces, on the spaces. Um, and, and it felt very natural then to put sound through it. And, and the title of the sculpture was The Song of the Vowels. And at that time, I was working with four other people. I was the director, but they were bringing in elements that, that they were offering that were gonna be part of our piece. And that, that was Sarah Swenson and Luke Johnson and Douglas Waddle. And um, it was up to me to then put it all together, pretty much. I was, that was my final responsibility, although we all worked on that. Uh, and I had felt a lack of verbal, verbal sounds. Uh, and when I saw the sculpture, it just fell together for me. So there, there, there was a task that I was trying to accomplish and that seeing that sculpture gave me a poetic idea, let's say, for how to make sound. I didn't want to just make verbal, uh, non-verbal sounds. This, this tied it to something solid, to something observed that I could bring imagination to. Bonnie, I don't know. I, I mean, I keep sitting in the middle of both of you and I don't need to. <laughs> I'm the least interesting person here. So is, is, is there anything you'd like to come back on there? No, it's just thinking about the difference. Uh, I, was just, I was actually thinking of something uh, from years ago when I was an undergraduate uh, and which went on obsessing me for over 10 years, uh, which was when we were doing linguistics and we had to do phonetics uh, and we were made to draw the mouth, which uh, we had to call the buccal cavity. And uh, we didn't draw it like in biology class with curves and shapes. Uh, it was a kind of geometric depiction. So basically trapezoid. Uh, and then uh, you paid attention to the positioning of the tongue and the lips uh, and the streams of air and how those uh, factors uh, would create sound. Uh, and I, I became very obsessed with this and everyone has probably heard me say this a lot of times, who's heard me ever say anything, but I started mapping the vowels in rhyme schemes and sonnets, for example, by Jared Manley Hopkins and noticing where they were literally higher or tighter or lower and further back in the throat and wondering what that meant in terms of emotional response but also thinking that if people didn't have an embodied practice of reading aloud, uh, how terrible it would be to read rhymed poems uh, in a way that the, where the eye skims, uh, and that in a way you only get the full release of those poems effect uh, if you can feel them streaming through different positionings uh, of the buccal cavity, you know, the tongue, the teeth, the lips, uh, soft palate, all these things. I, I don't want to force a connection, but, but I guess one way of thinking about some of these connections is through the idea of performance or performativity, whatever that means. Um, but it's also the third term we've got in play tonight, and I, I wonder if we could we could speak to it um, directly. Uh, so again, I know this is a really broad question, but but can I ask you both to just reflect a little on how you think about performance, which is maybe has some different attachment to intention than happenstance or accident or just, just gesture. Um, Vani, would you mind continuing on that? I was just thinking, I'm not very good at giving definitions of things like performativity when there are illustrious colleagues, former colleagues in the audience who I'm very happy to see. But 
I was thinking how much of everyday life is a studied performance uh, and that whether it's uh, consciously or unconsciously studied uh, feeds into what people nowadays call privilege. Uh, I don't mean to be bashing London at all. London is a great city, even though I don't live there and have very seldom worked there, uh, it further north. But uh, I remember in London twice being aware of the body as performance. Uh, and this is, does need a content warning for serious violence. Uh, and one was after the shooting of Jean Charles de Menezes. Uh, and uh, this is partly because I think he was running and had a rucksack and uh, had a brown complexion and fitted the profile of a terrorist, so he was shot. And uh, I remember after that, the brown body in the London underground uh, being tremendously careful not to run. Or if I, if I did have to run for some reason, I felt as if it were taking a risk. Uh, I got a kind of not exhilarating, whatever the opposite of exhilarating is, a kind of adrenaline fueled feeling like a child that I, I was doing something really strange to be running for a train. And uh, so I started performing leisure. I started performing, being perfectly at ease in the underground and never needing to run. And of course, that's very odd. Of course, one the other, the other thing is when I was with my friend, Nikki Santelli, who is both an, a performer and a researcher of authentic jazz and swing dance, and also an editor and scholar of prose poetry. And Nikki and I had gone to an art gallery together. As we were looking particularly at the Renaissance paintings, we started wanting to make flowing movements. We didn't want to walk around the gallery. We wanted to stand in front of the paintings and very slightly move in response to them. And the invigilator didn't like it at all as you can imagine, and we got moved on rather quickly. But it just struck me, as, as Simone was speaking about uh, her performance uh, and uh, the, the joy and translation and response uh, between the concavity of the sculpture and the intentional voweling of the voice and the concavities of the body in motion, I just started thinking how we have to perform decorum and in a way, neutralize, cauterize any instinctive or joyful response. I'm not suggesting that they go dancing around art galleries, or I, I possibly am suggesting that perhaps you should be able to stand in front of a painting and, and, and curve. Why not? Um, Simone, can I ask you the same question about your relationship to performance or performativity and whether they're they've ever sat as comfortable terms with for you or not? Well, I, I get very excited about performing and I get very nervous when I'm going to perform, which is kind of a contradiction because I'm interested in, in the work itself and not so much me as performing. Um, I think of an example, I'm not sure that this answers to your question, but I, I was dancing somewhere in Switzerland, I forget which city, and um, in a period of time when I was watching animals very much in zoos and watching their, their structure and comparing the structure, say, of an elephant and, and my structure and how, how the spine seems to work in the two different situations. And, and, and I, I want, and of course, I, I, I would never work with some idea of what the front and what the back is. There's no front and back. And, in an elephant um, or in me. Uh, and Peter and I had been hosted by a family, the 
the woman had a club foot and she watched me go through these, this vocabulary of movement that I had developed by, by studying, for instance, how a polywog becomes a frog going from a waving lateral action to a symmetrical action. Um, by the way, I've read that the, the polywog becoming a frog goes through a stage of falling over a lot. And after the, the concert, she told me that this was the first time she had felt her foot normal and functioning. This it's an incredibly powerful story and, 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 and there's a connection just behind it that I wondered if we could pick up on which is that you you, you uh, made reference to your visits to zoos and the studies you've done about animals and, and talked a little earlier about quadrupedal positions and crouching and crawling and Vani you mentioned of your um, ill-judged caving experience <laughs> you're talking about the movement of a snake but also the immense presence of the rocks above and below you. And, and I just wonder, is there something for us to pick up here about the relationship between human bodies and non-human bodies? About, um, without using uh, default hip new materialist language, the, the sort of thinness that comes with embodied experience and certain ideas about performance as well. Is that something you would pick up on Vani first? Unfortunately, as you said that, I was just thinking about worms uh, because uh, I mean, this probably should probably come with a content warning again. But I've been reading a fair amount of contemporary fiction for a work assignment over the last few days. Uh, and uh, a few of them, I, wish, I shouldn't give too much away, but I, I have been thinking about bodies and the difference between cremation and the difference between that and you know, turning into proliferation of ash or allowing oneself to be dispersed by a proliferation of worms. So that that's a bit of a non-answer, but I'm not sure, it kind of is and isn't, but I'm never sure about why humans are so much in opposition between you know, other types of animal or thing and don't recognize the itness in ourselves. And I'm going to show you my embarrassing fridge magnet. This is from when there was a Diplodocus cast, Dippy the dinosaur, installed in Norwich Cathedral. Dippy was in tour around the UK in various locations. And uh, you'll notice that the cathedral keeps going up well beyond uh, Dippy's head height. And even if Dippy would have uh, his, her, there, its neck all the way up, there'd still be plenty of room. So one really curious thing about the scale of that uh, is uh, I went there expecting uh, to be wowed by a dinosaur cast. Uh, and instead of which it was like the cathedral saying, uh, it's a chicken, I could fit six or seven of these in me. So there's that curious thing about scale and uh, I do wonder about what kind of scales we're willing to encounter in language and poetry and why it is that people seem willing to read massive long novels, uh, which uh, you could use as hand weights, uh, but they don't want poems to be more than about 30 lines long, otherwise it becomes difficult or something. And, and, and what it is about being able to scale yourself humanly to a certain extent of language or a certain stretch of language. The other odd thing about Dippy was that uh, Dippy rezoned the cathedral and people started behaving in different ways. So they often started congregating under his tail, but for some reason leaving his, leaving his head alone, exactly as if he could really swing his head. And the, the really odd thing was going in there with a friend's hound, uh, a Hungarian Vizsla, which is a very tall, noble, heraldic looking sort of dog, like ones that walk off a tapestry. And dogs are allowed in the cathedral, they definitely are allowed, which is why we took Otto in. 
but we thought Otto wouldn't know what he was looking at. But <laughs> instead of that, Otto looked up at the dinosaur cast and then with a kind of look of dawning horror, looked all along the dinosaur and then looked at the people standing around. And if you could translate his expression, it seemed to be saying something like poor fools. And then he started walking a large circle around the dinosaur, giving it extremely dirty looks. <laughs> and I realized that he had gone into guard mode. He was just interpreting it as a sort of dragon. So I don't know. I, I don't think we give people and animals enough credit for the way we perceive ourselves as a scaled by or relative to the scale of other things around us. Is that something that resonates with you, Simone? These questions of scale and human animal relation? Yes. Um, I, I very much feel that we are animals and that we are animals among other animals, that, that we're uh, very developed in certain ways. Um, and not to get into like that, that we've been on the moon and that that really singles us out. Um, but um, I often, well, I have thought that, for instance, a dog, if, if a dog gets separated from its master or from the family that it's part of, it, it has no way of, it doesn't know the ropes. It, it, it's in a bad situation. You could say the same thing about one of us if we get separated from the hiking group, from the climbing group. We, we don't have a cave that we've made. We don't. I, I love to garden. I used to have a kitchen garden and um, the bugs that you get to see, you see a lot of different life forms and they, different kinds of life forms react differently to you. Um, some are very smart at escaping, others are not afraid of you or try to escape, but don't really have the speed. Or what I'm trying to say is spiders interest me a lot. I like spiders. I've had pet spiders in corners of the house. Some, some of them are very quick, seem very smart, and some are very slow and easy to kill if that's what you're after. I'm not saying it yet, but I think that when you pursue something, you understand a lot about its intelligence, mm -hmm. how it avoids you. you. You're engaged in a competition, um, or I'm sure if it's pursuing you, you, you learn a lot about it. Um, worms like to stay clean. They don't, they don't like to get wet dirt stuck to them. Um, you can learn that from gardening. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm not being clear on what I want to say. No, no, it, was, it, it was really just to sort of meditate on the, on the prompt anyway. And I'm, I'm conscious of the time. And, and there's another question I'd like to put to you both, if that's OK. It's a bit of a, a, a change of tact. <clears throat> but one of the things that gets really both difficult but interesting about trying to talk about something like sculpture and poetry is the fact that you start to straddle art forms or cross over between them. And in, in, in the cases of you, the professional histories of you both, you, you have a primary identity. Uh, um, Marnie, uh, primarily known as a poet, Simone, primarily known as a movement specialist, but you also both do lots of other things. And I just wonder if, to, 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 to conclude, we could talk a little bit about the relationship between that primary identity and those other things you do, those experiences you have of working across or between art forms, 
And again, it's a prompt rather than a question, but I wonder, Vani, would you go first and just maybe talk a little bit about your experiences of working across or between art forms? Yeah, well, I hadn't thought of myself as having a primary identity as a poet, because when I was younger, I took myself incredibly seriously as a prose writer. And I wrote a nonfiction book on memory and landscape, uh, which uh, is over 200 pages long and nobody has wanted to touch, because I was told by several agents that it needs a story of someone growing up. And I kept saying, well, no, it's not that kind of book. But I keep thinking that if I do write poetry, I mean, obviously I do write poetry, I've written lots of it. It's against that background of also thinking in prose and trying to think through different media. One of the things that obsesses me is the quality of time in experience and how you can fall through different layers of time in terms of uh, what's present to your mind. And so for example, somebody could seem to go very still physically, but they might be revisiting some motion in their mind, uh, or they might be incredibly in attentive to some motion in the external environment that they might be feeling within themselves. Uh, so there's a non-correspondence between what you see bodily in a human and how much movement uh, the inner self is engaging in or with. And uh, I think one of the things that's been most important to me in recent years is engaging in traditional masquerade in Trinidad. Uh, so that tradition which goes back uh, to the different spiritual beliefs or political practices uh, of the many, many peoples who ended up on that island. One, because uh, spirits are thought to walk the road at carnival, they're thought to love carnival because of the time they can come out and play and be among everybody and do whatever they like and not only be undetected, but be positively welcome. And if you do the traditional masquerade, which is what I do, you do see people coming out from all the different communities, like the Rada community from Africa who keep up their traditions or the indigenous communities doing things to hallow the road. And uh, often the costume that you're asked to inhabit will have something to do with one of those traditions of the landscape uh, in a way that is hard to explain in the global north uh, because it's not about cultural appropriation. It's about becoming the mass. So the mass is the masquerade, uh, but the person who plays the mass uh, becomes the mass and eventually is a mass. And so you get a kind of freedom as well I remember being part of a section which was supposed to meditate in the movement of the sea, but uh, my human part was uh, costumed as a sailor, but then there were these extraordinary structures uh, of rippling semi-translucent fabric, uh, which made movements like the sea, it my very light, lightest movement, uh, and there's a black and white fish that was caught very high above my head, I had to extend my, the sense of my body. And I remember seeing a man vomiting and abandoned by his fellow masqueraders. He was not in traditional mass, he was in the pretty mass, so the entertainment one. And uh, I went up and I tapped him on the shoulder and offered him some biscuits and some water and some tissues. And he looked at me and he went absolutely pale and jumped because he looked at me and he didn't see a carnival reveler because I was in the traditional masquerade costume, he saw himself uh, being tapped on the shoulder by a mass. But in a way, because I was a mass, I was able then to give him things uh, without any of the normal social intersections of gender or class or age or health or whatever. It's like, I am the mass in this particular guise. I have the freedom of the road. I will give you my biscuits and then I'll just disappear again. It, it's not a power move, it, it's more like inhabiting the borderlands just for those two days. Thanks, Vani. And Simone, sorry, could, could I ask you the same question about your experiences of working across art forms um, as someone who's always drawn, as someone who's made holograms, um, and of course always felt the movement of beyond dance, I guess. 
Well, I, I think if, if I need something, I reach for it, whether it's sound or movement. And um, one piece I have called cloths, C-L-O-T-H-S, and um, it's four frames, large wooden frames, large, about five feet by four feet, each one with this series of cloths attached to it. And there's a performer behind each of these frames covered with cloth. And the performers are flipping a cloth over every once in a while. So the audience sees these three cloths, a red one and a transparent one and one plaid one. And every once in a while, one of the cloths changes. And meanwhile, the performers are also occasionally singing a, a song just like they might sing in the shower, even if they don't know the whole song, they're, they're singing a song. So there are these silences, there are overlaps of songs, there are a song and a cloth flipping over. And um, the inspiration for that, we're going to go back to life things of things from life. Um, I had a dream that my husband told me he never wanted to see me again. So instead of going away, I hid behind the couch, behind a curtain, behind a door, because you never see the performers. You just see the cloth flipping and you just hear the song. And so I have that situation on my hands and I, I needed to work with it. And um, I just reached for whatever. And I got a bunch of cloths from Trisha Brown's sewing basket um, and so on. I got songs that people knew and I put together this piece. And also I knew that Kurt Schwitters had made pieces where the people never show up. The movement is made by objects. I this is um, a perfect way of finishing. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to apologize for us overrunning because that was an amazing conversation. So I just say a huge thanks to you both, Simone and Vani, for joining us, to everyone in audience uh, for sharing the event with us and for your questions. Just to thank you both again and to say, I hope to those in audience, we'll see you at some of the later events too. <laughs>